Joshua Fields Milburn. Welcome to Mentally Stronger. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate you having me. I'm excited to talk to you because between your your Netflix documentary, your books, your podcast, and everything else you guys do, you've started a, a movement, I would say, on minimalism. I think people probably have heard about it, but you've really taught them what does it mean. So before we dive in and talk more about minimalism, maybe you can just define what it actually is. Yeah, I think the short answer is minimalism is the thing that gets us past the things so we can make room for life's most important things, which turn out to not be things at all, right? The average American household has 300,000 items in it. That's a statistic from the Los Angeles Times. I didn't go around counting people's things. And you know what? That at first sounds like it'd be wonderful, right? If you imagine you go back a couple hundred years and you told the average person that, in a few generations, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of things in our homes. My first thought would be that's going to increase my happiness, my security, my tranquility, my equanimity. I'm going to feel more tranquil because I have all of my needs met. I've addressed the problem of scarcity. But of course, as you've seen, it's done the opposite. Not only do we have a lot of physical clutter in our homes, but those material possessions are a physical manifestation of what's going on inside us. So if I have a lot of external clutter, which I certainly used to, I was living the American dream, I also had a lot of internal clutter, spiritual clutter, psychological clutter, and mental clutter, emotional clutter as well. And then I think it manifests in other areas of our lives, which just makes that mental clutter worse, you know, the calendar clutter the busy, busy, busy hustle mentality. Uh, of course, we have relationship clutter in our lives, or we have career clutter, workplace clutter, right? And it, you start to see it manifest everywhere, news media clutter, social media clutter. And it's because we keep saying yes to everything. And on their own, each new possession you bring into your home, it's not like it's, uh, it's going to harm you by itself, but the accumulation of tremendous amounts of excess. We have access to more excess than anyone in history. We're living like kings and queens from the 15th century, and yet none of us are happier. In fact, we're more stressed than ever, we're more overwhelmed than ever, we're more depressed than ever, even though all of our basic needs are met, and yet it feels like our psychological needs, our need for community, our need for connection, our need for love, those needs are, are not being met at all. And that's really where minimalism came in for me. I grew up really poor, and, and I thought the reason that I was so unhappy growing up is we didn't have any money, not realizing the, the discontent actually stemmed from the chaos that was going on in the home. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, poverty, uh, we were on food stamps and government assistance, and and I thought, oh my goodness, if I could just make some money, that would fix everything. And so I joined the corporate world when I turned 18, and I climbed the corporate ladder for the next dozen years, and by age 30, I was living that American dream, the big suburban house with more toilets than people. I had the closets full of designer clothes. I had the luxury cars, plural, um, and, and I had everything to fill every corner of my consumer-driven life. And although I was living the American dream, it wasn't really my dream. And in a weird way, it took getting everything I thought I wanted to realize that maybe everything I ever wanted isn't actually what I wanted at all. And two things happened to me. My, my mother died, my marriage ended both in the same month. And it was like getting into two car crashes within a, a few weeks of each other. And everything started spinning out of control and I started questioning everything. Why have I given so much meaning to all of these material possessions? Why am I so unhappy or why am I so discontented? Who's the person I want to become and how am I going to redefine my own success because this thing that I've called success, the status chasing and, and uh, the accumulation of stuff, it's just not working for me. And so I knew I needed to simplify and that's really where minimalism stepped into my life. You know, as a therapist, I've never had anybody come into my office for help because they were underwhelmed or because they had too few things. And I've worked with people all over the spectrum, people who are extremely wealthy and people who live well below the poverty line. But often it's the symptoms that they come in for, which are often related to having too much in their lives. They're overwhelmed by 
too many things in their calendar. They're stressed out. Or they told me that they can't ever do anything because they're constantly cleaning. Well, why are they cleaning? Because they have so much stuff that there's no place to put it. So they're just shuffling from one room to another. And people that hold on to sentimental items because they feel guilty by getting rid of them brings up all of these emotions. But what do we know about mental health and minimalism? Like, how did that help you in terms of your mental health? Well, by clearing the excess around me, I started to make room. And you think about the most peaceful spaces in your life. Maybe you go to a museum. Quite often, the museum is not defined simply by the artwork. That's a component of it. But it's defined by a lack of excess. It's defined by the open space. In a weird way, it's actually defined by nothingness. The space between the things is just as important, if not more important. And in our homes, what we often do is like, oh, let me just put more in here, right? Imagine if you went to your favorite art museum, like the LACMA down the street here in Los Angeles, and I walked in there and they just started cramming more and more pallets full of art into these giant open rooms. It's not like if I put 10 times the art, I'm gonna get 10 times the benefit. In fact, the opposite ends up being true it starts to get in the way. It removes the purpose of the museum in the first place. And guess what? The material possessions in my life removed the purpose of those things. There's nothing wrong with material things. I get value. In fact, here's a weird paradox. As a minimalist, I get far more value from the few items I own than if I were to water them down with dozens or hundreds or hundreds of thousands of trinkets. And so by letting go, I didn't let go of everything. I'm not an ascetic. I let go of the things that were junk or some of the non-essential things that were not adding value to my life. And when I did that, I started feeling freer and, and I could even use the word happier or more tranquil. I, I certainly felt lighter. And when you start feeling lighter continuously, what do you do? You, you realize that there's a, a calm and you're removing that mental clutter. And I think you brought up a really great point a moment ago. People don't come to you because they don't have enough. They come to you because they have too much, which in a weird way is a not having enough. Having too much means you have more than enough. So you don't have enough. You have more than enough. And so what I realized in my own life was it wasn't about adding more things or getting the right things or replacing these things with these things and then I'll be happy. It was about subtracting, removing the excess to get down to enough. And the only way you can do that is if you identify what is enough for me. And I think that's perspectival. It's going to be different for you from what it is for me. And your enough point for clothes will be different from my enough point. Your enough point for relationships will be different from my enough point. Your enough point for hours worked in a week is going to be different from my enough point. But what is enough? We never, in our culture, we never stop. We never step back and say, how much is enough? How much is enough money? How much is enough material possessions? How much is enough time spent with family and friends? And we realize that I'm lacking in some areas because I'm overcompensating in all of these other areas. I've got too much over here, and so I don't have enough tranquility. I don't have enough peace in my life. I have to give up some of this so I can get some of that. I absolutely agree. I didn't set out to be a minimalist uh, initially, but I moved onto a sailboat seven years ago. And all I could fit in a Fiat, it was a dog, a cat, and like, a laptop and a couple of items. And then I moved on to a sailboat thinking I'd be here for six months. So I thought I don't really need anything. Well, seven years later, I'm still on the boat, but living in a small space really makes you think twice. Do I need that thing? Or if I buy something, I have to get rid of something else to make space for it. Now, again, I'm not like the world's best minimalist because I do still have a house that has stuff in it somewhere else that still sits there. So, but I certainly see the joy of having less. And then suddenly you have so much time. I don't have to shop for anything. I don't have to spend time worrying about so many things that I would if I still lived in a, in a big house with lots of stuff all the time. A lot of that's just taken away and it's removed from the calendar. It's removed from uh, even my thought process. I don't have to think about it anymore. But how do we decide like what's enough for us if there's not like a rule of you should only own 100 possessions or if there's not a hard and fast idea of what's enough? How do we pick what's enough for us? 
That's a great question because I wish there was the list of the 100 items that you should own and then you'll be a good minimalist, you'll get your certificate and now you'll be happy as well. And you have everything you need and that is enough. But the truth is it's a moving target. Uh, when I first stumbled into minimalism, I was 29 years old and I started simplifying around that time. And what was enough for me then, meaning what adds value to my life, has changed over the last 13 years. I'm 42 now, and my life looks appreciably different. I have a wife, and we have a 10-year-old daughter, and uh, we have a house, and we live in Ojai, California. I don't live in Dayton, Ohio anymore. And so like, things change, and as our life changes, two things need to happen. I need to be willing to question the things I'm still holding on to. Just because something added value to my life before doesn't mean it's going to add value today or tomorrow. Just because I got some value from it doesn't mean it will continue to produce that same amount of value. And so I'm constantly interrogating and questioning the things that I'm holding on to. I don't hold on to things just for sentimental reasons. Uh, I think it's fine to have a sentimental uh, association with uh, a material possession, but if it's the only reason I'm holding on to it, then that's a type of clinging. And, and when you, we cling to something, it's a great way to unlove the thing and the memories and everything else. However, if I'm still getting value from something, and it can be a, a decorative item or a sentimental item, that's fine. If I still get value from it, great. But then I also want to question the things I bring into my life going forward. As I simplified my life, and I started letting go of the excess things. At first, I was like, well, I don't need to bring anything new into my life. But that's a a type of deprivation. I'm a minimalist. I'm not a deprivationist. And so I don't want to deprive myself of things that might add value to my life. And I've identified that there are three categories that all of your things can fit into. You could go to your house. I don't care if you have a 5,000 square foot home or if you live on a boat. Every possession you own can fit in one of three piles. We call this the, the no junk rule. Uh, the Minimalist put out this, what we call the Minimalist Rule Book. It's 16 rules for living with less, uh, which people can download for free over at theminimalists.com. One of those rules is the no junk rule. Everything you own fits in one of three piles. It's either essential, it's non-essential, or it is junk. Uh, that first pile is similar for everyone. We all have similar essentials. Housing, clothing, food, transportation, education, vocation. We all have similar essentials. They look different for different people. Some people's education, like mine, I didn't finish college. Other people have, you know, if you have a, a doctorate, then that's fine. What is essential for you? Education is going to look different or your house is going to look different from my house. We all have similar essentials. Then we have the second category, the non-essentials. These are things that actually add value to our lives, but strictly speaking, I could live without it. I can live without a coffee table. I can live without a couch, but I don't want to deprive myself of those things because they do add value. Now, I've questioned those things, and I will continue to question those things. And if they cease to add value, I'm willing to let go because a willingness to let go is one of life's most mature virtues. However, unfortunately, most of the things we own, they fit in that third category. They're not essential. They're not non-essential but value-adding. They are junk. These are things we've held on to because maybe they added value once upon a time, or maybe they added some hypothetical value in our minds. We saw that great orange oversized sweatshirt on a mannequin. We thought it was going to look great on us, but I got it home, and I'm like, oh, I don't like the way this fits. I don't like the way it looks, so I throw it in the back of a closet. It's junk. I haven't got any value from it. I'm not getting value from it now, but I'll keep holding on to it because of what? The three most dangerous words in the English language, just in case. I'll hold on to this just in case. And those three words, in fact, we have a rule called the just in case rule in that rule book where folks uh, have identified that most of the things we're holding on to that we don't want to let go of, we're holding on to just in case. Ah, oh, but yeah, maybe I'll use it someday in some non-existent hypothetical future. And so I'll just store it away here. And the problem with that isn't the one item that we're holding on to just in case. We hold on to tens of thousands of items just in case. And they don't just take up space in our home, which is a cost that we have to pay. We're essentially buying these giant storage lockers and we're surrounding ourselves with excess things that aren't adding any value. But also what's happening is as we're, we're holding on to these things, it's causing this mental clutter. It weighs on us psychologically. It weighs on us emotionally. 
there's this weight to our things that extends beyond the, the physical object itself. And so how do we identify what is enough? We identify what adds value to our lives. And if it doesn't add value, then, well, it's okay to let it go. And I like your orange sweatshirt analogy because how many people have clothes that they bought, brought it home, aren't wearing it, but then you feel guilty that you purchased it. So you hold on to it because you think, I don't want to get rid of it because that's brand new. Yet at the same time, you don't wear it and then you feel guilty for not using it or not wearing it. But you think someday I'll wear it somewhere where that will be appropriate or where I'll feel like wearing it. And then those days don't come and then it just does, it piles up, like the guilt piles up or the feelings of overwhelm. But something you mentioned earlier too about sentimental items, those are tough because for a lot of people, like you buy that souvenir and I know you guys are against souvenirs, you buy a souvenir when you go somewhere on vacation and you think that this souvenir represents that memory and if you get rid of the souvenir that somehow that will erase the memory or it will... Yeah. Uh, you'll forget about that wonderful trip you took or the people that you were with. How do you balance that with knowing that sentimental items are okay to an extent until they start to cause problems for you? Yeah, when it becomes clinging, that's when it's a, a problem. When we cling to something, it actually takes a whole lot more energy to cling than it does to let go. People will often ask when we do our live events, you know, the minimalists will, will go out and do tours and I've helped a lot of people let go of sentimental items, but they'll often ask, how do I let go of a sentimental item? And I just think about it this way. If the sentimental item is benefiting you in some way, why would you let it go? But if it's harming you in some way, why wouldn't you let it go? If I were to take a piece of hot coal and hand it to you, you wouldn't ask me how to let it go. You'd simply drop it. You'd stop clinging to it because you know it's harming you. It's harder with the things that aren't harming us physically, but they're harming us emotionally, psychologically, and aesthetically, they're, they're harming us too, right? And so the thing that I've had to understand, this was so important to me. I learned it when my mother died. That's how I was introduced to minimalism. When she passed away, I had to go down to Florida and deal with her stuff. And like any good son, I called up U-Haul. I asked for the largest truck they had. And then I needed to rent a storage locker back in Dayton, Ohio, because I already had a big house full of stuff, so I couldn't commingle my mother's stuff with my stuff. It just wouldn't fit, right? And so, you know what I'll do. I'll rent a giant storage locker, and I'll put everything in there just in case I might need it someday in some future that is somewhere around the bend. I didn't really give it much thought. I just knew that I couldn't let go of all of these beautiful sentimental items that she had because I wanted to hold on to all of her, what? Her memories, as you just illuminated. But then I thought, and I said, well, wait a minute. Mom isn't in these things, just like I was never in the things that she was holding on to from my childhood. And it made me realize something really important. Our memories are not in our things. Our memories are inside us. Now, I can hold on to a few things or take pictures of things that might trigger the memories that are inside me. But as soon as I realized if I let go of some of her things, I wasn't actually letting go of the memory. So I took photos of many of those sentimental items so I'd have those triggers for the memories. But then I wasn't required to hold on to a giant dresser or armoire or coffee table that I wasn't going to get any value from. And then I also learned by letting go of those things, I could potentially add value to other people's lives because I wasn't going to use those things as they sat there locked away and giant storage locker, just locked away in perpetuity. But by letting go, these things could find a new home where they actually would serve a purpose in someone else's life. And I thought that was incredibly freeing because these things weren't truly sentimental to me anymore. They were only sentimental because I assigned some sense of sentimentality to them. But as soon as I decoupled the memory from the thing, it was so much easier to let go. And that's where I've gotten bogged down in my own life too, is my mother passed away when I was 23. My husband passed away when I was 26. So like mm. my mother's stuff, you know, sweaters that nobody else was ever going to use, I uh, inherited. And then my husband had, you know, his childhood baseball cards, things like that. Like, what do you do with those? Yeah. And figuring yeah. that out. And it, it's been a slow evolution over the years of figuring out, you know, I don't need to hang on to everything and it's not dishonoring them by getting rid of things that I'm no longer going to use or things that maybe somebody else could use, 
but it was a process for sure. And part of the grieving process was to let go. But it's not always just about losing a, a specific person. I think there's grief involved for a lot of people in parting with certain things. Somebody who has a health condition and they can no longer go golfing might still hold on to their golf clubs because like that's part of your identity of who I am. So it's hard to get rid of those items or somebody buys a, a sweater that's two sizes too small because that's who I wish I was. Mm. And getting rid of those items, I think, is really difficult emotionally. How do you get rid of those kinds of things? I agree that there's grief involved in that process. I would also say there's more grief involved in holding on to something as opposed to letting that dream die. And letting a dream die is one of the most difficult things that we can do. You know, I'd love to spend more time with my mother, but she's not here. And I could dream about it all I want. It's not going to happen. And none of those things are going to bring her back. In fact, what they're often going to do is allow me to amplify my grief as a constant reminder. We came up with another rule called the spontaneous combustion rule. This is my favorite of all the minimalism rules, which by the way, you'll find these aren't actual rules. They're just boundaries that we set up for ourselves and they're adjustable for anyone. This came up at one of our live events. Someone was really struggling to let go of a sentimental item. And she came up with the microphone and asked her question. And I just asked her, well, what would happen if that thing spontaneously combusted? Would you replace it or would you feel a sense of relief? And I could see the expression on her face change and her shoulders softened a bit. And it was like this full body sigh, like a, ah, like oh, I would feel relief if that spontaneously combusted. Well, then you have your answer. If you let go of that thing, you're going to feel relief. However, you know, there's some things, like I've got my phone here in front of me, and if this thing spontaneously combusted, I'd just go replace it. So, okay, I probably don't want to get rid of it then, right? And if it did spontaneously combust, I'd be inconvenienced by it. I would go replace it. But there are many things that we hold on to that we know if I just got past that first step of letting it go, I would feel this overwhelming sense of relief, of clarity, of, um, of peace, because those things aren't a piece of me. And you use the word identity earlier, and that's spot on. That's why it's so difficult to let go. Imagine if I had to cut off my hand, it's a piece of me. But then we've done that with all of our material possessions as well. We've even done it with our emotions, and, and you know this. Like, we don't say, I feel sad, I am sad. <laughs> that's who I am, man. Isn't that so much harder to let go if that's who I am? Right. And we become wrapped up in our identity and we become wrapped up in our job titles because that becomes part of our identity. Our material possessions become part of our identity. I'm a golfer. Well, not a person who likes to play golf. I'm a golfer. Well, if I'm a golfer, it's going to be a whole lot harder to let go of those golf clubs. But if I'm just a person who used to play golf, guess what? A lot easier to let go of those golf clubs. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So for somebody who's listening and they say, all right, I probably have 300,000 possessions in my house and I'd like to have fewer, where do they start? How do you get going on this? Well, usually people don't know where to start at all because you walk into a house that's full of stuff and it's like, I don't have any momentum. All these things are sentimental. All of them are, are difficult to let go of. You certainly don't want to start with the sentimental items, things that feel most precious to you. You can get to those eventually, but you need some momentum before you work up to that. The truth is there are many things in your home you know you could get rid of, but you don't know where to start. We have something that we call the 30-day minimalism game. You can play it for free, theminimalists.com slash game. You can download the free calendar. Here's how it works. You play it. You start at the beginning of a month. You partner up with a friend, a family member, a coworker, anyone in your life who also wants to let go of some stuff. And the first day of the month, day one, you get rid of one item each. Now, at the beginning of the month, you can bet whatever you want. A friendly little bet, you bet a dollar, a nice meal, a vacation together, whatever it might be. You, some friendly competition. Because I don't know about for you, but for me, decluttering is kind of boring. And so I want to inject some friendly competition into it. First day of the month, you get rid of one item. Anyone can get rid of one item. I don't care what it is. Usually we start with the easiest things. Go to your closet and don't start with the old clothes. Start with the new clothes you've never worn. So that thing that still has tags on it, oh, I've had it for two years, but it still has tags on it. Well, I know I'm not going to wear it. 
give myself permission to let one thing go. Second day of the month, you each get rid of two items. Third day of the month, three items. Fourth day of the month, four items, so forth and so on. So it starts off really easy to get you that momentum you need. But by the middle of the month, you're like, oh, crap. I have to get rid of 15 items today, and then tomorrow I have to get rid of 16 items. It gets a bit more difficult, but you've built up that letting go muscle, so letting go is a little bit easier. Whoever goes the longest throughout the month wins, and if you both make it to the end of the month, then you've both won because you've gotten rid of about 500 items, and that is a really good start. We've had people play this game well beyond the first month. Some people just keep going, day 34, day 35, day 36, or other people just start the month over. All right, new month, one item a day, two items the next day, so forth and so on. It's adjustable for your level of, of tolerance and, and for how aggressive you want to be in your own journey of letting go. I like that idea a lot to make it fun because it is hard. And then how do you decide what to do with this stuff? Do you donate it? Do you give it to somebody? Do you try to sell it? Do you throw it out? I have a formula for, that for my own life that has worked really well for me, especially when I was in debt and I was trying to pay. I'm, I no longer do debt, but when I was trying to pay off the debt, I would sell anything that I could get at least $20 for. That number for me now, I'm out of debt, is 100 bucks. But at the time, it was anything I could get at least $20 for, I'm going to try to sell it. And if I can't sell it within the first week, I lower the price. If it doesn't sell within 30 days, then I donate it. If it's something that cannot be donated, then I will recycle it. And then ultimately, if it can't be sold, donated, or recycled, then it is trash. And I don't need to keep trash. Like I don't keep my my trash in my from my trash bin in my house. I eventually throw that out as well. That is true with our material possessions. When a home is filled with excess junk, it is no longer a home. It is a trash heap with four walls and a roof. And so I'll let go of it using that process. Sell it. If I can't sell it, donate it. If I can't donate it, recycle it. If I can't recycle it, I'll trash it, but I will get it out of the house and ultimately get it out of my life. I think that's important because I suspect there are a lot of people that have boxes of stuff that say to be donated or future garage sale and the boxes have piled up over time and they just don't ever get around to donating them or they don't ever get around to having that yard sale. So it still sits there. So to have that process is really important. Finally, what about, we've talked a lot about physical clutter, but it's not just our material possessions. What are some of the other kinds of clutter that, that we should be aware of too? I think the most pervasive forms of clutter are the invisible clutter, hidden clutter, we call it. The one that has come up the most recently for me uh, with the Minimalist Podcast, people calling in, it's calendar clutter. There's a tremendous amount of busyness in our lives. And why is that? It's a status symbol. Oh, what have you been up to lately? Oh, I'm just so busy, right? Look how important I am. I'm busy. To me, busy is the worst four-letter word in the English language because it justifies me saying yes to everything. But what we don't realize is when we say yes to every commitment, it's, and it sounds good in isolation. Oh, yeah, that sounds like it'd be fun. Oh, yeah, it sounds like that'd be nice. Oh, yeah, I could do that. Oh, yeah, it's just an hour, whatever it is. We're saying yes, 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 these micro commitments. We accidentally end up saying no to the things that are most important to us. Because I said yes to this, and I said yes to this, and all of a sudden, you look at your calendar, and it's full of a bunch of things that in isolation seem like a good idea, but now the things you really want to do, you're no longer able to do. Everything that is urgent to someone else has now become important to you, even though it doesn't really feel important to you. And the only way that I've found to get away from that is uh, an idea from Derek Sivers. He wrote this blog post, which is, was eventually turned into a book called Hell Yeah or No. If something is not an emphatic yes for me, then I am going to say no to it. And it's really difficult. Is this a hell yeah? And if not, I'm going to say no. It's not because I dislike the person. It's not because in isolation I wouldn't want to say yes to it. I would. But with everything else I have going on, this isn't a hell yes for me. And so as nice as it sounds, I am going to say no because I'm saying yes to my peace. I'm saying yes to the things that are more important to me. So for somebody who's listening and they're now, all right, I'm kind of onto this minimalist thing, where's the best place for them to learn more about what you do and how to become a minimalist? You can just visit our website. It's theminimalists.com. All of our resources are there, our social media, our podcast. 
our documentaries. We've got a couple from Netflix and um, you, everything you, you might want to find about simplifying your life, a bunch of free resources there as well, the free minimalist rule book, et cetera, theminimalists.com. It's a great place to start. Well, Joshua, thank you so much for inspiring all of us, I think, with your wisdom about how to be happier in life and get by with less. Oh, I'm really grateful for your time. Thanks for taking this opportunity. Thank you so much. It's time for the therapist take, the part of the show where I'll give you my take on Joshua's mental strength building strategies. Here are three of his strategies that I highly recommend. Number one, ask yourself what value something brings into your life. So often we buy things out of habit or we hold on to things just because they were given to us as a gift, even though they don't really add value to our lives. So I like that Joshua reminds us to ask ourselves whether something adds value. You might find that you hold on to gifts people give you out of a sense of guilt, not because those things actually bring value into your life. Or you might keep things out of habit or just because you paid a lot for it, not because it adds value. So asking yourself that question can help you get rid of things that aren't actually improving your life. Number two, use the spontaneous combustion rule. If an item spontaneously combusted, would you replace it? That's such an interesting question to ask because you might find that you have tons of things that you wouldn't replace. Do you really need that lamp in the corner? If you broke a mug, would you need to replace it? Do you need to keep your old bones or all those pairs of shoes? If you wouldn't go out and replace them if they disappeared, you don't need it in your life now. Knowing that might give you permission to get rid of things. And number three, create a challenge to start subtracting things from your life. The idea of having less stuff might sound good, but actually getting rid of things is tough. So I love that Joshua suggests creating a fun challenge for yourself that turns a good idea into concrete action, and it increases the chances that will make it happen. You don't necessarily have to do the challenge with a friend if you don't want to. Create something that works for you. I've worked with people who decide that they're gonna clear out one bag of clutter a day for a month, or that they're gonna fill a box and then try to sell it for the next month. The hardest part is usually getting started, but once you do, it's easier to build momentum to keep simplifying your life. So those are three of Joshua's strategies that I highly recommend. Ask yourself what value each item brings to your life. Use the spontaneous combustion rule and create a fun challenge to motivate yourself to subtract the things that you don't need. If you want to learn more about Joshua and minimalism, check out their podcast, The Minimalists. If you know someone who could benefit from hearing more about mental strength, share this show with them. Simply sharing a link to this episode could help someone feel better and grow stronger. Do you want free access to my online course? It's called 10 Mental Strength Exercises That Will Help You Reach Your Greatest Potential. To get your free pass, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Then send us a screenshot of your review. Our email address is podcast at amymorinlcsw.com. We'll reply with your all access pass to the course. Thank you for hanging out with me today and for listening to Mentally Stronger. And as always, a big thank you to my show's producer, whose sneaker collection prevents him from being a true minimalist, Nick Valentine.